Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Um, I think we are live. Welcome, everyone. I'm super excited that we finally have another game dev um, conversation. And yeah, who could be a better starting speaker for our game dev um, conversations again than Josh? Hello, Josh. How are you doing? Hello, Joey. I'm I'm doing okay. I'm fine. How How are you? Ah, thank you. It's yeah, it's an interesting situation. I think for all of us these days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You would have thought that we would have found a routine by now. <laughs> but it's it's really fuck. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's like I, 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 I thought I had a grip on, on being locked in my room for ages. But like half, like four months ago or something, I got serious, like, what is Hüttenkolle? Is that translatable? <laughs> yeah, um, that you're like the way that you feel weird. Intense feeling of stress. Yeah. From being locked in. Okay, so yeah, but yeah, I'm 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 I'm, I'm doing fine. Like having a balcony <laughs> really helps. That's really good. It looks like you're like in the middle of nature. I can hear like birds and <laughs> this looks really yeah. lovely. Yeah, I mean, like there's some houses right behind that tree. But it, it it's it's pretty secluded. Cool. Very nice. No, no, not no, lovely. So thanks again for yeah, I'm um, joining today. Um, before we start with um the questions, um, would you mind like giving us a little bit um like a introduction of yourself? I mean, I I think you're. Yeah, I mean, I mean, your projects are known, and and it's your contributions to ga game dev are known. Um, but to give you a little bit of an overview, and especially also point out what, from your side, what do you think it's important? Um, I don't think. Yeah, I, 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 I think of being maybe maybe I'm known in a very specific circle of developers, um, which is which is nice. You know, it's it's not bad. Um, but uh, okay, so my name is Josh. I make video games. I have been making video games for a long time, or like for a long time, for like seven or eight years by now. I'm mostly working in small teams, and we're making independent games. And the like constellation of the of those teams constantly changes, depending on who is um, around and can work with me at the time. I've made free browser games for five years, maybe, maybe longer. And I've, for the last few years, I've been trying to actually make a living from making games. So I've started to sell them. Um, we've made Ord and Gut Whale and most recently Quant and also the 10MG collection, which is like a collection of 10 minute long games. Um, and we've released it all onto Steam and some of them are also on other consoles, and I can kind of make a living from that um, because I, there's no overhead. Like, there, like, there's literally we we do revenue shares and teams, and that's it. Like, I'm like if if I do the calculations correctly, I'm probably living way below the poverty uh, line, <laughs> but I am surviving from making games and also doing freelancing and teaching on the side. Like I've taught at the FH St. Croton recently for a semester. That's, 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 that's me. I'm making weird games that nobody seems to want to fund most of the time. <laughs> so we <laughs> always have to keep them very small and manageable in scope to actually finish them. Which has been going well, and I've start, two weeks ago I started working on the next commercial project, which I cannot talk about, but which I'm incredibly excited about, and which will probably be out in like three to four months. Oh, hopefully. looking forward to to hear about this once once you can talk about it. And I mean, I mean, yeah. recently you've also put a lot of effort into creating videos, and I don't know, like oh, yeah. and blog posts and. Yeah, uh, like uh, Quomp, the game, I, the last commercial game I released, has been such a big part of my adult life. Like I started making it 
I don't know. Yeah, the, 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 the development started four to five years ago, and then a lot of shit happened in between, and now it, it finally got released in February, and I just had a kind of crash. Like, it was, it was the thing I was thinking about um, every week for a long, long time, and now it was finished, and I had a kind of um, identity crisis, I guess. Like, without this game, like, looming over me, what what do I do? And so I, yeah, I started to make essays about video game design, which like nobody needs because there's so many of them, but it's such a fun process mm -hmm. and it's so enjoyable. It's a, it's a shit ton of work, but it's so much fun. And I kind of did that as a vacation, which I could kind of like justify to myself by saying, okay, at least I'm like researching game design. Um, stuff. I mean, but it's, 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 it's amazing. So much fun. That's a very productive vocation, I would say. <laughs> the videos are, are amazing. And like, did you did you just learn that? Like how to edit the videos and how did that work? I've, I've been like, before I made video games, I did every other creative medium, like even more unsuccessfully. <laughs> Um, like I, I started doing stop motion animation when I was like nine or something. So I have the basic editing stuff I just knew how to do. And like also sometimes cut trailers myself and I just picked up on stuff over time. There was not really the learned, the hardest, the, the, really the hard thing to learn with making these, these essays was writing. <laughs> That's so hard. Like I knew it would be hard, but I didn't expect it to be so um intense <laughs> it's really like uh yeah it's but, but that's that's also what i like about it because it's it's something new that i know nothing about and i don't have any <laughs> um big like there's no pressure there yeah. like i can just make a stupid youtube video that's like 40 minutes long and if it's really bad, like I'm, I'm happy with the videos, I'm happy with how they turned out, but I know that if I do some really stupid YouTube video, there's like one million game design videos that are much more um, surface level and even less coherent than what I, I when like there's the, 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 I feel like the bar in that video game design area is very low. So it feels very comfortable for me to just do stuff, which is maybe mean, but I, there's some stuff that's like actively harmful, I think, actually, in that YouTube bubble. Yeah, yeah, I cannot agree more. And then, like you already mentioned, there's a lot of pressure, and I think, yeah, this is always like super important that you don't let that overwhelm you and those bubbles mm -hmm. where you're in. Um, do you did you find any methods how to how to cope with that? Um, with with the pressure of like releasing mm -hmm. a game. I don't make stuff that I'm not convinced about, I guess. Like, ultimately, I have to kind of trust myself with that. Or it's like, like, to, <laughs> I think the, the like, principles of, of game design or whatever that I subscribe to, I, sus I, sus I, sus I, I believe in them so strongly that if I just follow them, um, like with dedication and don't like cheat and don't take shortcuts in that um, and like what kind what kinds of games I want to make then through that process I automatically like discard everything that I wouldn't be proud of it's just the very the hard part is then to keep going after you discard something <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 I think the the much harder part because if, if, if I don't think something is up to snuff or something is like worth pursuing, then I am kind of incapable of working on it anyway. Yeah. The hard part is to find that conviction that something is worth doing and then keeping that for long enough. That's the, that's the real struggle. <laughs> I, I just wanted to pick exactly on that because like, how can you actually identify what is worth pursuing? What not? What is a good direction to go? It's it's hard. I tried like I'm I'm keeping a devlog for the project I'm working on now, and it, I tried to 
figure out why I was so excited for that thing. Um, how, how, I don't know, you just kind of know, I guess. Like, this is something where, where I draw from, like, the... Like, I've made a shit ton of games, and with a lot of them, I'm really not happy. I think a lot of them are really stupid and bad. <laughs> and, like, par like, the products of horrible processes. And all of this experience gives me a kind of intuition where I can kind of, like, feel. Like, it's, it's a super unsatisfying answer. But it's like, you just kind of know if something is worth pursuing for yourself. If you're honest with, I, th I think that's the core. I think that's the that's the important part. Like you can only know if something is worth doing if you're honest with yourself. And that's like what I learned through making so many games where I wasn't honest with myself. But like, it doesn't matter even if the idea is like objectively stupid, which no idea can ever be. But it's like uh, if 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 it's a really horrible idea, but you believe in it for some weird reason, then you can pull it pull it off. If you actually believe in it, I don't know. This is super rambling. <laughs> mm. No, no, it's a it's a hard question, and often it, uh, there's this th a theory that sometimes you have this like gut feeling um, that things are right or just feel right, but often this gut feeling mm -hmm. is sort of like a little bit confused with an actual intuition which comes from previous experience. And I mean, I can remember you had this crazy project where you um, developed a. Uh, one game a month, if I remember correctly. Um, yep. And, and this, this was like, this was so, so good because actually you had this full game development cycle. You, you were ex able to explore so many ideas and probably, or maybe you had this experience like where you see, oh, this already felt weird in the beginning. And maybe you learned over time how to, to get this intuition, mm -hmm. which many are missing. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's what I what I wanted to say before, where it's like, I can compare, like, I, I just have, like, this weird book that nobody but me can read, and that book is, like, full of my own personal development <laughs> experiences, so when I, I have, like, this very specific stomach ache about a problem, or about a game, or a project I'm, I'm working on, I can, like, look into that book and be like, oh, wait, I felt similar to this with this game, and this is how that game turned out, and then I can check if I'm happy with that or not, or like what aspects of that game were good, and I can then apply that to the stuff. But it's so personal and it's like so directly connected to like specific memories of like where I lived and what I like had for dinner, you know, or, or like very specific stuff where I like connected with this with this gut feeling. So it's yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's it's. It's a stupid answer, but I just, it sounds so stupid, but I just know if something is worth pursuing for myself or not. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a month or two to figure out. Most of the time it takes like four days until I realize, okay, this is not going to work or this is not going to be enjoyable to make for myself, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, 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 this, this is so fantastic that you that you have this feeling and that you have this intuition and that's really worth a lot until it betrays me right so far it has kind of been correct most of the time but maybe maybe with this project i'm i'm, I'm running into a trap and my like sensors are clogged or something like that no i guess i guess I guess that's also that's like the second part it's like having intuition and then just not doubt doubting the core not questioning like the core idea like once the project is underway there's just certain stuff that if you would change it it would remove all of the progress you've made so far and would force you to go back to square one and there will always be insane doubt about a project, but at some point I think you just cross cross the threshold where it's like you cannot go back. Like you cannot. There's there's a point until which you can kind of go back, but once you have crossed that point, you have to just ignore the doubts and go forward. Otherwise, you're never going to finish it. So yeah, there, there's no straight answer. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I don't know. I just think I know, and then I believe in myself and do it. And I think that's 
yeah <laughs> so something yeah. which which is a little bit tackling this topic too um i mean where would you get the inspiration for for your games from is this i don't know mm. environment books other games movies i can so there's like two projects i'm working on right now one is the next game that's going to release and the other is a, like we've been in like pre-production for six months and like trying to figure out how to make the idea work um but so for those those two games i can just say that the the, the the next game that's going to come out is just i played a game from the 80s and i was like wow this is such a cool core mechanic and this core mechanic like this this core thing sorry has not really been explored in this specific way like somewhere in the history it got lost and it has all of these 80s design philosophies attached to it but i can just make take that core part and modernize it or like just make it my own and i was like I, i played that game for three hours and then i stopped playing and i was like okay this is that's it i'm gonna make like <laughs> i'm gonna take this specific part and make it my own um so for that case it was just a, another game um for the project we've been working on for six months the specific moment of inspiration was watching a, a video about the game design history of from software like they've made like the from software yeah i think like the dark souls people like they made stuff like kingsfield one through seven before like even coming close to dark souls but all of the little parts are already there it's just expressed through um old hardware and stuff like that and that got me thinking um about like what because Dark Souls is such a like central piece of current game design, um, and it started like 20 years ago. So it was that that got me thinking like, okay, so what kind of piece of game design could I make now that if I keep working on it for 20 years could be really really cool in 20 years? <laughs> and then that thought experiment led to a mechanic, which is so hard to make that <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we have to finish it, but it's uh, stupid. So it's mostly probably other games. Like I get my inspiration from games and games adjacent media. Like the specific moment of inspiration where I'm like, shit, I want to work on something. I want to work on something in this direction. I want to do this specific thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's probably games and games adjacent media, which is not good. <laughs> probably not. Not the you know goes kind of against what what people are saying about like getting your inspiration from real life or from stuff like that. And whatever works for you, right? Um, I, I, I mean, in, in the end, it's really a matter of where you draw in inspiration from. And, and I mean, I, a lot of people, I think, um, get this when, when playing other games where, where they just see, okay, hey, there was something which I really liked, but this was underexplored or there, there was something which they eventually did not like and could be, could be fixed. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, how much time do you actually spend playing games? This is this something which... Because a lot of developers actually say, hey, no, I'm sitting in front of the PC all day long as I'm developing games, but I'm not yeah. actually playing anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm looking it up on Steam because I've, like since I started making essays, I've been playing very in, in a very focused way where... Okay, Steam doesn't open. Um, where... Okay, so sorry, the basic question was how much do I play per day? Um, it differs a lot. Like two months ago, I was playing maybe four hours per day because I was trying to really understand um, a specific video game. But right now, for the last month, I haven't played at all, I think. I've played my own game on Switch when it came out because I wanted to see my videos. <laughs> But that's... Uh... No, that's not true. I played some Hotline Miami. But not a lot. It's it it it's it's like in general, my whole like life cycle is changing constantly. It's it's very project dependent. Like after finishing Quamp, I had a month where I just relaxed and I played a lot of video games during that time. And then um, I made I, I decided to make a, a video essay about Disco Elysium, and then I only played Disco Elysium for like a month. <laughs> 
um, which is like how much of that is playing and how much of that is research. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so it, it just completely changes depending on what else I'm doing. Right now, I'm, I'm barely planning anything. Your, yeah. the, the, the last video essays were about Limbo and Inside, right? Yes. Why, yeah. why did you pick those two? I never played them until after finishing Pump. Oh. I always I always thought like, okay, so Limbo, it, it's kind of a cheap horror game or something. It, it looks very basic. And it was, yeah, I was very, very wrong. Um, but I'm also very, I'm incredibly lucky that I didn't play Limbo and Inside before finishing Pump because if I had played that game they would have done like psychic damage to me <laughs> and like I would I would probably have had a harder time finishing my own game um, I picked them because they made me so excited about video games um, like I, I, I've, they originally I, I just wanted to make one video about Limbo and Inside and I started to write that script and it was just too much like I really go into detail with this shit this is this is like even if I stop making video essays because it, the writing is so hard and takes such a long time, maybe I don't have time for it. What I really like about this like foray into another expression or like a medium or whatever is the the process of like really breaking a game down. Like I, I I played through Limbo and then I watched the footage and I just wrote down each puzzle and like put it in spreadsheets and shit. And that gives you such a great perspective on games. I, I really love that. But yeah, I picked Limbo and Inside because they are masterpieces both in their own right. And they made me really excited about being able to make video games myself. At a time when I was thinking like, okay, maybe I'm, I'm done. <laughs> maybe Quant was the last game I'll make and I'll do something else now. But they kind of rekindled uh, fire. I, I cannot agree more. They're really, they're really masterpieces, and and it's really motivating. I don't know somehow motivating to to, to play them because um, we can see actually what what can be achieved. Um, yeah. Crazy. Something which I, I I would love to talk also a little bit about. I mean, this. Can you tell us a little bit more your background? Um, like how how did you actually get got into game development because I always find find this also really fascinating. So the the story I always tell, which is true, is that I was skipping school when I was like 16 or 17 and I got caught by my computer science class teacher um, and he just caught me skipping class and he forced me to because it's like students are not allowed to be unsupervised. So I was forced to attend this computer class. Um, where they were learning Scratch from MIT, like the basic little building block thing. And I fucking loved it. And I made my first video game that night. Like literally, it was a Friday and I just stayed up all night and like immediately went to crunch, crunch culture and made no, a game. No, can, can you remember uh, what was the game about? Uh, it was a ninja game. You were a ninja and you had like this senpai person like meditating on this cliff and that like teacher was telling you like oh you have to do your final ninja test and then like snakes come from the side and you have to like chop them up and it was incredibly hard um and it's it's got deleted off of the scratch database because i think they just cleanse their their stuff every few years or something i, I tried to find it a few years ago it's it's gone but yeah basically i realized like oh wow i can just make a game um but I mean, I've been telling interactive stories to my brother since I was like maybe seven years old. Like we basically simulated a version of Minecraft in our bedroom where I would be like, you're stranded on an island. You have a pocket knife and a sandwich. What do you do? And then he would be like, oh, I, I, I try to look for food. And then, oh, you find some berries. What do you do? We, we, we would tell these simulation game things and then like he would build a house and he would like tame goats and we would have to remember all of the stuff that was going on until until we lost track of it and then we just started again and I've like I've been making board games and I've been running pen and paper campaigns and stuff since I was nine so I've been I've been doing a lot of stuff in games I just never realized I could code with visual scripting 
so that's how I got into it. And then I took it, I, I realized it was a career kind of thing when I saw Indie Game the movie, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which is, of course, the origin story number one. Uh, <laughs> and then I got more serious about it. And I think it took five years of trying until I am where I am now, which is probably under the poverty line, <laughs> but, but making games. Is, yeah. yeah, but I, yeah. I, I really love that story. I, I find this very inspiring. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I adore Scratch. And this is like, yeah, really a success story here. Scratch is cool. I think much cooler for kids is Twine. Mm, yeah. Like I've been, been teaching uh, Twine to like school children as part of like workshops and stuff. And it's amazing what they come up with. Like after just an hour of explanation, they just go crazy and make really elaborate, cool interactive fiction. Um, yeah, it's cool. But uh, yeah. yeah, but but um, speaking of like where you are now, Josh, where are you now? <laughs> 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 I'm in the mythical forest of back pain and uh, coffee abuse. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm in Lower Austria. Um, and it's very nice. <laughs> it's, it's 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 fantastic. I hear the birds all the time. I I, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I... You kind of get used to it. Like uh, you 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 forget how beautiful it actually is until someone else points it out. It's kind oh. of fucked yeah so how, how does your like daily life look like like what is your i don't know how does your day look like i have uh like I'm, I'm i'm generally speaking i'm not a good example of like good practices um i wake up way too late to have a good day and then I immediately go and smoke a cigarette while drinking a coffee. And then I like I eat breakfast and all of that stuff. And then I just I'm, I always every morning I'm like, okay, so there's this like specific stuff I have to do. Like I have to send these five emails. And then I sit down and I like open my email program and then I have an idea and then like three hours later I realize oh shit like I'm knee deep in the code and the writing of this current project and I should really do this other stuff and then I don't and I just can't like really it's been like two weeks now of um, like I took weekends but it's been two weeks of being unable to do anything but make this game it's really like a, a curse like today, well, today I finally managed to pull myself out of this, but I've been basically only working hmm. and reading stuff for research. It's not, it's not good. I can't help it. I know it's not good, and I try to go for walks every day and stuff. Um, but it's mostly just work right now. Yeah. How how many hours would you work then? I mean, it, it sounds like you're getting into this, into this flow state or like, how can mm. we imagine like, how long is such a session? It's hard to say. It's different. I probably work for like three hours, then another three, and then maybe another three, maybe like nine hours per day. But then like, in the end, it gets to questionable territory. Because this is another horrible thing that I do where I mix my like research with entertainment. So if I'm doing like, like nor like there's there's some YouTubers who are doing like very specific in the game reviews and like essay stuff that I really enjoy. And when I'm like researching something or working on something, I'll specifically seek out like those two hour long videos about like, oh this is how the narrative design in this weird PS1 game works. And then I'll watch that and like, I'm in this fugue state between work and entertainment where I'm like, normally I would watch this for fun, but now I'm also kind of taking notes and it's, it's not good. Like I really, really have to change that. Like talking about it now just makes me realize how bad that is. Because long term, my spine is just going to break um, if I don't do something about that. <laughs> yeah. 
But I mean, um, something which seems to be really good, some really many people would be are really striving for is like that you get into this deep work state. I mean, this this mm. sounds like you're really into into it, like especially those three hour units. I mean, they're yeah. perfect deep work states. How how mm. any tips? How do we get there too? <laughs> how how do I get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> um there's some stuff that I've been practicing for just some time. It's like to never try to finish something completely, like never leaving the project in a state where you're like, okay, this part is completely done. And now I have to start like completely from, from scratch tomorrow on a completely different thing. Like I always have different kind of construction sites open in a project mm -hmm. where I just kind of know, okay, this like there's this, three to five things and after that I just forget about them. Um, so like when I finish one of them, I can start working on another one and that will probably open a new problem. And then I, there's constantly this like these many different roads that I could go down. Um, and especially since on this project I'm working completely alone, I have to do the art as well. So if I get uh, really bored with one thing I can switch to the other to get into that. I don't know. It only happens to me like this intense hyper focus thing when I'm learning something, mm -hmm. um, when I'm not just executing. That's why I'm, I'm really having a hard time doing level design as a freelancer. I've tried multiple times and it never turns out well. Um, because it doesn't feel like I'm learning something. It feels like I'm executing. And yeah, like with the video essays as well, like I, I, I wouldn't call this positive. <laughs> like I wouldn't call this something that you would want to get in. Um, because if you, or maybe you want to get in. Okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe it can be productive to be like this obsessed with stuff if you can get out of it as well. If you can really, if you have control over it, because I don't have control over it. Um, not as much as I would like to, at least. Yeah. But it's been like that forever with me. Like I would, we would call it like fevers in the, in childhood, when I would get really interested into dinosaurs for like two months. <laughs> and then there was nothing else I was interested in. And then it would just at some point stop. But yeah, I don't know. To get into that, to get into a state of like good focus, it probably helps being interested in what you're trying to do. And it probably also helps if you're a little bit out of your depth. If you're a little bit um, confused about what you're even doing, because then a kind of survival mode thinking kicks in. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you. Is, is something like procrastination for you a thing or do you always find something yeah. which... I've been procrastinating answering a specific email for 14 days by working really hard. <laughs> it's like it's... Uh, uh, I get intense blocks for specific stuff. Mostly it's like answering emails or going to the bank. Like I have to go to the bank for literally two months now and I cannot bring myself to do it. Like it's, it's, uh, I, I was almost on my way today, but then I turned around and did something else instead because it, for some reason it gives me a deep primal fear <laughs> to do that stuff, which is, it's completely irrational. It's uh, very stupid. But then I, I, I definitely procrastinate that for probably legally harmful amounts of times. Mm. Like I lost a lot of funding last year because I did that with uh, signing a contract because it scared me so much. And I pushed it off so much. Like I procrastinated, procrastinated getting a shit ton of money for quantum. <laughs> I procrastinated myself out of funding. So yeah, I, it's definitely a problem. It just happens with important stuff, not with making games. Have you 
Have you found any techniques which help a little bit or still looking? There's definitely times when I get it like if, if, if I look at it like in a, in a time span of like 10 years, I've been getting a lot better at this. Like uh, I'm a well put together human uh, compared to myself 10 years ago. It's just um, it's a slow process. Um, like I would put off going to the bank like for a year and I'm only at three months now. <laughs> and it, it seems good like I'm on track to actually do it. Um, so there is there is progress. It's it's just extremely slow. <laughs> it's just very very glacial, um, but it is there, which which gives me hope. <laughs> yeah, it, it's I don't know. It's just I guess every time I then stop procrastinating and like finally open that stupid email, I realize like oh wow this wasn't bad at all, and then these kinds of experiences accumulate and accumulate and make it easier for me to to open the email sooner <laughs> in the future. Uh, I, I just got to ask, there's a very scary background noise. I think it's gone now. Oh, yeah, no, there's constantly airplanes driving. Ah, ahead. OK. <laughs> yeah. I thought yeah. this, this, this was already a little scary for a second. Um, another v word which is used quite often, like procrastination and motivation. Motivation. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have there any, I don't know, things yeah, which motivate course. you, which help, which or hindering you maybe? I don't know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Motivate, I, I, I guess that ties in with the thing we were talking about in the beginning about um, what were we talking about in the beginning? <laughs> um, it ties in with the with the thing where you're like, if you believe in a project, if you kind of like have this gut feeling that it's right, there's that kind of includes motivation for me at least. But there are always after I finish a project, there are huge stretches like the longer I work on it the longer the desert period is where I have no motivation at all, where I can't pick myself up like it's, it's kind of like a for, I, I see it like mentally as a kind of battery thing that gets charged when you're not motivated and then when you are motivated it gets like lower <laughs> it's, it's it for me it just works on a very very long term basis like it's it's either i am like like i said before either i am interested in something or i'm not interested in anything at all and realizing that those periods just switch on like a, like on a on a taktung on a on a rhythm of like three to six months has helped me kind of deal with low motivation periods like I just know oh like after Quomp was finished I, I felt horrible and I was like okay I, I, there, there's nothing inside of me that I want to do there's no motivation to make games at all but because I felt this like so often before I realized okay I just have to wait and now it's back and after I finish this project it's going to be gone again and then it's going to be back again and then you know at some point I'll hopefully uh, retire. <laughs> I, I, it, it, it feels like that's just how it's going to be. And that's okay. I don't know. Oh, no. I, I don't hear any audio. Oh, that's... Um, oh. There we go. Um, yeah. No, this, this, this absolutely makes sense. I mean, it, it's so interesting that you actually learn how to, like, accept it, basically understand it and just accept it by a, I cannot agree more because everyone of us has those like constant ups and downs with motivation and I don't know I don't know if it's like society or like the pressure from work or I don't know but we're constantly trying to keep it up as the highest possible level push us even further but um, I think like also accepting that it's okay at some point that 
um, that you're not motivated and that you need some time to rest and I don't know, find yourself again. Hmm. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, <laughs> it sounds so. It it I I yeah I don't know. I think I think the the key part like when motivation is low. Um, it used to be <clears throat> like four or five years ago when I was low on motivation, I felt horrible. Like really, I was so angry at myself because I couldn't keep working because I felt that if I didn't, if I wasn't like productive, if I wasn't motivated, then I was kind of nothing. And I've been becoming more like confident and just who I am and like what I do over the last year, years. And this, this like self-confidence, this like knowledge of like, okay, I will become motivated again. And when I'm motivated, I actually do good stuff is like the key factor in accepting the low motivation parts for me. That's like the, one of probably one of the most important things I learned over the last few years is like, oh, if you just believe in yourself, like life gets a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, this is important, um, especially that you know so many things about yourself and what, what your mind does and how, how, how to and, and accept that. I, that's gold. Is there? Yeah, I don't know. Are there any like people who who motivate you? I mean, maybe mentors, role models. Do you have any like I, I don't know, like game dev heroes? Or I, I I don't know how to how to frame it better. That also changed um, over the last four to five years a lot. Like like I said before, I started with indie game the movie, which was like my introduction to this whole lifestyle <laughs> as, as it probably should be called <laughs> um, uh, in the in the death the lifestyle oh my this oh be... yeah oh that's the sequel yeah. <laughs> 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 um, um it it like i i really looked up to like ed mcmillan and jonathan blow um and i never played fez sorry Phil fish i'm i'm I'm, I'm a horrible person for not playing your game. Um, but I really looked up to those two people. And then, of course, like Rami Ismail and JW um, have been like just directly visible influences on my work, I hope. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's It's been kind of surreal because then like I, I was in the space for so long and I was lucky enough to be able to travel so much that I kind of met them. Like, I've never met them, but I, I kind of met my heroes, and it's not like I now hate them. I just realized, like, oh, okay, they're, you know, they're people, and they, they're they kind of doing their thing in their own way, and, and like, what can I really... I f I, yeah, I, f I think the, the important thing about all those, like, early hero figures that I really admire deeply, I learned about them is that like if I admire someone because I want to be like them and then I do the same things that they did to become like them it's not gonna work out and I'm gonna become untrue to like who I am and I'm gonna lose myself in their view on the world and that happened <laughs> and it made me unhappy and then uh, after that I've been trying to kind of not to put people on pedestals so much um, and like not trying not to like, yeah, glorify people because what that leads to for me is like me wanting to be like those people mm -hmm. and I can never be like those people. But I like, so like the, the early people were all of the, the indie people also, um, Terry Cavanaugh, um, uh, like VVVVVs amazing um recently it's been more spread out and like i i get a lot of um reassurement like of, of like strength or like like when I, when i feel like i should quit or like it doesn't matter what i do um what often makes me reconsider that is a american rapper named aesop rock who's been making uh, independent hip-hop for like 200 years and 
has made one album that I really, really like, and all of his other albums are good, but extremely cryptic and basically only exists for like very specific fans of hip hop and are extremely unapproachable. But this guy <laughs> has just been doing his thing for all these years. And I don't, maybe I don't, I, I don't really enjoy his, his later output or like I don't really enjoy most of his output, but some of his output I really love. And he just keeps going. And like, it's, it's not that I want to become like a American independent rapper. It's, it's kind of too late to become American. Um, but just, yeah, seeing like, like those kind of persistence stories of like people just that keep doing their thing, even if I don't enjoy what they're doing, but just that, yeah, that, that conviction in their work is what I look up to these days. Right. Yeah. This sounds, this sounds really wise. Like I, I think it can be, as you mentioned, sometimes dangerous if you really pick one specific person and then all of a sudden you really try to, I don't know, become them because I mean, you cannot become someone else. You are who you are, but I think it certainly makes sense that um, if you have this, I don't know, potpourri of people, um, which, um, which sort of has interesting, I don't know, could be techniques or uh, maybe like, like you mentioned, like motivations or lifestyles. And you just pick s some of those things and, and see how those things might work for you. Um, I, 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 li I like this idea a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, it, it's, it's kind of the same as with making games, I guess. Like you're, gonna glorify the wrong people or you're gonna glorify people at all um just because they amaze you and then as time goes on you kind of grow away from that or like yeah i don't know it's like it's like you yeah you you you, you take something that that's really important to you for some time and then that changes you and that because it changed you, you no longer think it's so important. So then you take the next thing and you just kind of move on until you retire, like I said before. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing which I always find really interesting, like, um, I don't know, in, also in terms of ins inspiration and motivation, I don't know. Are there any important books which were like in the past relevant for you or what are you reading now or something which has had an bigger impact on you and I mean maybe not only books maybe also movies and I think that game question would take for a separate <laughs> stack um, so in terms of books I've when I was like nine or eight or something I, I had like I broke my arm and had severe burn injuries on the rest of my body from like multiple accidents and I could do nothing but read and I read all of the Lord of the Rings novels and then like Harry Potter. And those are just a big part of my life. Um, not necessarily in terms of like inspiring me what I wanted to do, but just like I, I think two months ago, I reread all the Harry Potter books. And like, because they have been with me for such a long time, every time I read them, I can kind of compare like how I felt about them back then with how I feel about them back now. And they're just, you know, this kind of like a constant in, in, in my life that I can refer back to, to kind of reflect through them. Um, important books in my life, probably the most, and this is of course super pretentious because this has been my entire thing, probably the most important book, like not in terms of like literary importance, but like importance to me personally was probably Infinite Jest, which mm -hmm. I read when I was like 20, two or 23 or something, which is like the perfect time to become obsessed with that book. Um, because it, I don't know, it gave me a, a, a kind of puzzle to solve or something. It, uh, no, no, no. What, what, what Infinite Jest did was it, it showed me that I'm not as smart as I think I am. <laughs> because obviously this, this book is uh, in, in, insane. Um, very very hard to understand and it's like so many weird themes and like cross references like i i, I don't understand it I've, I've read it multiple times now and i have no fucking clue um how it really comes together 
but it's like yeah it it it, it just showed me like okay like uh get off your high horse there's obviously someone who who knows a lot more about everything and like it, it was a really humbling experience reading that book um i don't know how that influenced my game design stuff <laughs> um it just made me realize that i'm i'm not as cool as i think i am um in terms of movies like there's a, a, a lot of books i i, I read kind of I, I read like I do everything else apparently, <laughs> just like very intensively for like a few months, and then I don't read for some more months. Um, but I'd like to, what I can generally recommend uh, to do is to go to these public libraries where they have just like random books that people don't want in their homes anymore. Um, like they have one in Graz, I know because uh, this is just like a Billy Regal. Mm -hmm. shelf it's just like a shelf somewhere and you just take out a book you just take some random books and read them it's so fascinating like i've read books about astrology and stuff that i would never touch otherwise because i just pulled them from that shelf and it's such a easy way to kind of like get new ideas in your head often those ideas revolve around um becoming a good housewife but, but sometimes there's very interesting ideas um in those books as well Probably, okay, so yeah. In movies, I really, really like Korean cinema. I've, I've just yet yesterday rewatched uh, Mother by Bong Joon Ho, I think. There's just something about the colors that I really like. And that, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I just really like Korean cinema. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I guess I don't know. I don't have a real answer to that question. <laughs> no, this was already good. Like, was the, was the one book is now already on my list. Are there any like hmm, game design books which you read and you found useful? I, generally, they make me angry, um, which is stupid. Um, but like the the book of lenses i try to read like when i was in graz uh Anna has a copy in the office and i borrowed that and it's it's like it's it's just by nature of writing stuff down like i i i know this i've tried to do it myself but when you try to write stuff down you either become too specific or too wide to be really useful and then the reader has to do the work themselves to pick out the useful stuff it just I don't know. I have a hard time reading it because reading game design books because they always present themselves as like this is the truth, and I always I don't like them and I get defensive and then I have I just fight against the book in my head. I'm like, oh, this is stupid. Like I I think I read one book from Ralph Coster, and I didn't understand it at the time. I just know that it made me very angry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good cool I, 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 I just have the best images now in my mind <laughs> yeah, yeah sitting in the subway scree screaming at a, at a book like this is not correct <laughs> especially the Ralph Costa book this is full of like lovely drawings and comics and I just imagine you <laughs> no <laughs> yeah there's some stuff that I found really useful. What is what I really like is the NDA paper, um, oh, yeah. which is like three pages. That's amazing, um, and I really enjoy what is his name, the Civilization Designers Formal Abstract Design Tools Sid, Sid Meier. Um, paper. Sid Meier? No, no, sorry, it's it's one. It's not the Civilization guy. It's one of the people from who made Thief whatever jesse david cox whatever it's on gamma sutra formal abstract design tools um and just like these little tidbits semi-academic articles or game designer blog posts i think those form because they're generally more vague <laughs> and more like yeah i know this is a dumb idea but listen to this and then so i have a harder time accepting it <laughs> the ian shell made a whole game design course that's available for free as a PDF and you can just follow that whole course. 
and I did that course with uh, different groups of people multiple times um, because it's really good. It covers a lot of like theoretical groundwork and it's very practical and has like little homework stuff on the pages and shit. That's cool. So probably don't read books. I just read like the weird little snippets that I find on the internet. No, but this this is this is good enough. I mean, this is often how <laughs> like I don't know a starting point for for books, and I I don't know everything need not everything needs to be books. It's I. Mm. Oh oh oh! Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I have to interject because I don't read game design books, but what I do read is I I search out. Specific, like sometimes I just come across like oh yeah like uh, Jana Capello mentioned in her 1840 essay about architecture um, and then I search out those essays and then most of the time these essays all copy from one source like there's for most uh, fields of like art um, and research or like culture or whatever there are some really central pieces of writing that if you dig a little bit, you can find them, and they are like often hidden, like three links deep in a Wikipedia page. But um, these texts are mostly really, really good, um, and I read those those essays, like with the like all of the modern self help books, for example, basically copy um, how to win friends and influence people from the 1910s or something. Mm -hmm. It's always like you can save so much time of reading all these three million books that are supposed to help you by just reading this one book because everyone is copying from it and mm -hmm. it's that's that's a kind of hobby it's like searching out these texts um and then reading them and then thinking that i've done like a lot of reading in a short time feeling very happy <laughs> no but, but that's that's really true um, I think there are really some, sometimes it's hidden treasures you can find then, mm. which which often are actually meant for a different purpose or for a different field, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's like so much overlap. Like I read, uh, it's mostly 20th century stuff. It's a, I, I always forget the names, of course, but there's a, like, a lecture by a financial analysis from America of, of, yeah, like the 20th century in the beginning at some point. And she describes um, game production, basically. But she doesn't call it game production. She calls it um, like union negotiations. <laughs> and so she, she, she's made a talk about negotiations with unions in America in 1910 that maps one to one with like communicating with your team um, when you're making a small scale indie production in 2021. And it's crazy. Like, of course, you have to like do a little bit of like mind uh, tricks to to connect it but there's ah oh man I, I i love that essay so much i printed it out and made it into a little book <laughs> myself so now i have it physically as well hmm. yeah maybe maybe we can after after the talk we get a little bit of a summary of, of like your best <laughs> best of <laughs> yeah i have to dig through some links and I mean, we talked about books, movies, and games. Yeah. What are the influential ones, yeah. motivating ones, um, important ones? Mm -hmm. Uh. Hmm. Hotline Miami, probably. The first one. Um, there is a game that made me realize I could. Hmm. Yeah, V V V V V from Terry Kavanaugh, um, Downwell from Mopin, definitely, Downwell, big up on the list, um, Rain World is a mm, inexplicable masterpiece of design that I cannot understand, <laughs> it's such a weird game, but it's, it's such a mystery to me that I just come back to it every year and try to play through it again, I really like Mirror's Edge, Limbo and Inside, but those are not really influential. I've never played them. Um, yeah, I mean, there is one. OK, yeah, so in 2008, my, or something around that time, my father downloaded the Pirate Bay bundle from Moshboy. And it contained like 250 games. And he gave that to me on a USB stick and was like, hey, here's some games. 
and there was one game there where you ride on rockets and when you ride on a rocket you can control in which direction it goes and your goal is to not fall off the screen and not get hit by a rocket and it was insanely hard when i played that game for a very long time and i really liked it and i think about it sometimes and i have, will never find it again but it's 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 a it's a nice memory and world of cool probably it's just a joyful place in my head. <laughs> Can you remember uh, what was the first game you ever played? Silly Die Zauberin, probably. Uh, a video game adaptation of a German children's book um, about a witch who has a whole bla black house and a black carpet and a black couch. And then she has, also has a black cat, so the cat, so she, she trips over the cat. And what she does next, I will not spoil. You have to find out for yourself in Silly Did Sullivan. It's a great book. It's such a weird game because you had like, it, it, I, I remember spending hours just, there was this this one mini game. It was a collection of like mini games centered around the main story. There was this pot and you could put ingredients into the pot and then it would cook. And then if you put into correct ingredients, you would get out like a spell and something crazy would happen. And it was basically like a, combination lock puzzle but i remember spending hours there trying to find out those stupid spells and it had like a 10 second animation for the pot like boiling over and you were like oh my god is it gonna work and it didn't work and it, was, it was great i don't know like in my early childhood I'm, like we my father is uh, one of like one of the og programmers so we always had computers around but he's also opposed to like electronic entertainment kind of so we were only allowed to borrow. That's that's not true. It's not opposed to electronic entertainment. But they they wanted us to like not grow up on a computer. Um, so we were only allowed to borrow books and to borrow games from the library. So that that means we like went to the library to the little video game box and you could rent out any game you could find there for one euro for one week. And so we did that. And if we liked the game, uh, our father would burn the CD and we would keep it forever. So I played a lot of like weird games um, through that. That was a great. The, the, the probably the best game I found in that box was Robin Hood: The Legend of Sherwood, like a a clone of some top-down strategy game where you play as Robin Hood. That was great. I replay that like every year because I love it so much. <laughs> do do libraries still have games? Not this really. Still a thing. It's, it's all digital, I guess. Mm. And maybe they they realized that they were fighting a losing battle against <laughs> Steam, so they stopped offering like uh, entrance level drugs. <laughs> um, so, so the yeah. next interesting topic I would I would have, I mean at least for me interesting. I I would be super excited. You already mentioned like the communication with your team. So in general, mm. how, how how do you work? What tools do you use? How, I don't know, how, how does remote working with your team work? Or, I mean, as I suppose it's remote working. I don't know, I would love to hear yeah. a little bit. Uh, I've done two commercial projects with teams that were remote working. Um, generally, it means that since I'm like coding the game and designing it and organizing all the people, I hold 500 strings in my hand and I'm completely overwhelmed. And then I will always, because that's the horrible normal practice, I will not think too much about sound and music in the beginning and focus instead more on collaborating with the artist. And we do that exclusively through Discord. And we do that exclusively without any documentation <laughs> because like we're, we're there's a word for that where you like go into a situation without any safety net. We're just winging it or something like that. Oh, like, I thought of like I have... free solo climbing, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you're like, it's it's like a three-legged race, but you're climbing a wall, kind of. <laughs> so we, like, I, I, of course, I have documentation for myself and I like have notes and like kind of production schedules. But then the longer a production goes on, the more confused that is going to become. And then Google Docs just get forgotten and it's just pure chaos. Um, and I just try to keep everything in my head. And then at some point, I always start a physical notebook 
for each game. So I have like mm. something real that I can hold in my hand that I can then turn around and like just make a continuous list of to-do lists and stuff. There's always a lot of single sheet paper involved. I don't know why that always happens, but in the end of any productions, I'm always like rummaging through like uh, hundreds of, of papers with weird sketches on them to find the one where it was like, what 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 had we planned for this level or something like that. So it's it's pure chaos, and I'm very glad. Like the people I've worked with so far, especially Britt Brady, who has been doing the music and audio for both Gutwill and Quam is just a stone cold professional. Like, uh, he's like, okay, you want these sound effects? That's gonna take two days. And I'm like, okay. And two days later, he's like, here are your sound effects. And I'm like, thanks. And I know I can, I, I can just rely on him 100%. Um, and he's not doing this um, to like make make big money or like to, to be successful or something. He's the, he, he works at Goingsoft. Uh, he's the founder of Goingsoft. They made like Gato Roboto and stuff and they're working with Devolver. So like he's, he's just doing me a, a favor basically to help me with these games. And he's just amazing. Um, and that reassurance that I know like, okay, so if, I'm, if I talk to Brit and he says it's, it's going to take three months, it's going to take three months. And that gives me the leeway to then work with, uh, with the artists on a more direct level. And just kind of, in the beginning of a production, mostly we spend like the first quarter of it just I ask for assets and they send it to me and I implement them and then we look at them and say if we like them or not. And it's like a very, because the teams are very small. So then the longer the production goes on, at some point I will stop talking to the artist because I'm only one person and like their, their job is kind of done. And then I have to like abandon them and move on to the sound department. And then in the end, uh, I was always working with Clovel, uh, who's a Spanish programmer who's really good with the engine I'm using. So then it, it, it's like shift, it, it shifts basically. Like a, a production, it's like me being like, hey, here's these four people, let's make a game together. And then I look very directly at the artist. And then when the art stuff is done, I look very directly at Brit and then I look very directly at the coder. So like kind of do it step by step. And of course, everyone is doing work all of the time. But I, so yeah, since I have so much stuff to do it, that's, that's the process. I focus on one person who also represents one art man. It's not so. It's not so nice because it, like, yeah, it's weird. And you just like, I kind of have to just stop constantly, virtually hanging out with the person after like their big part of the task is done, and just move on to the next. It feels kind of rude, um, but it works. And like we we're, we're like open about that, so it hasn't been a personal problem so far. I think maybe someone is holding a grudge. If you hold a grudge, please tell me. <laughs> Um, and in terms of tools, I mean, you already mentioned Discord for communication. Um, what what other tools or, or I don't know, dev technologies, dev tools? If, 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 if with, with every project, I try to learn how Trello works. I mean, I know how it works. I just I can never be bothered to use it. Um, so there's no dedicated organizational software, um, which I maybe shouldn't say. If you want to fund one of my future games, we're very well organized. <laughs> Um, but uh, there's Construct 3 is the engine I'm, I'm using. We're doing stuff with Audacity. Most of the times I'll do like mock-up sound effects with DFXR by who made that? The sausage roll person, Stephen, Stephen Lavelle, um, which is a great free tool. And that's it. Google Docs, um, like I said before, I make a lot of Google Docs for every project and then abandon them. <laughs> That's it, like it's, it's, it's kind of a low tech operation, I guess. Oh, Aceprite, I use uh, Aceprite for pixel art, like both for resizing stuff to get it ready to implement it and also for my own sketches. It's a great piece of software and it's like 15 bucks. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so good. Oh yeah, that's probably like that's probably the game I play the most. Like I have four thousand hours in Acecraft on Steam. <laughs> um, this is now a little jump to a different um, topic. Um, but but I mean we were already talking about good sides of the game, the scene, and also bad sides. Um, mm -hmm. 
what I, I don't know what are your experiences what what are good uh, what, what what are things which are maybe good or not too good um by being in game development or especially in the development too it's i've experienced it, it's 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 a culture that prides itself on being open and accessible and that's fucking amazing um like i don't have any experience like trying to talk to someone in the music industry, but I can only imagine it's uh, much more horrible than here. Um, so like, it is pretty open and people are more willing to just talk to you, um, which is great if you're if you're starting out in the game. And, and grats with, with all of you people, I found a, a great community of people, um, which was super nice. There's the, 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 just the community aspect is amazing and worth a lot. Um, in game development, <sighs> the negative sides are when that promise is kind of impossible to keep. Um, like companies and publishers have to say that they are um, interested in working with indies, that they're friendly, that they're open, but there are just too many developers and not enough publishers. There, there's not enough resources to actually fulfill that promise. So I've had some really, really horrible interactions um with with publishers who say every day that they love small developers um which yeah i mean i'm, I'm not ashamed to admit I'm, I'm holding grudges for that i'm not forgetting that that was really horrible for me <laughs> uh but like bad sides it's i don't know it, there, there, there's a lot of snake oil salesmen around who are like i made a successful game Two years ago, now buy my ebook and stuff like that, which you know, it's it's a valid way to make a living and to keep making games. It's it's just I see, I'm oh yeah, I should probably say I'm a very cynical person. I'm not uh, generally very forgiving with that stuff, um, which I'm working on. But like, there's there's yeah like lifestyle bloggers basically who are like here's my lifestyle of being an indie game developer and then they make a little guy on the screen and the little guy does a funny interaction and that's a video that makes them more money than i've earned in a year and that's fine like i'm, I'm not specifically mad at them i just think it creates wrong expectations of what making games actually is and what it actually means but yeah it's an industry i think that's what I didn't want to realize for a long time is the industry and it's pretty stone cold and people will try to use you in many different ways. Like I've been asked to work on projects for like Hollywood people for free. <laughs> like they, they didn't want to pay me. And I've, I've been approached with like questionable business stuff. It's an industry and there are, you know, people who actually want it to be a community and there are people who don't want it to be a community. There are people who want to make a lot of money and then there are, I would put myself in the third category. Like I really enjoy the community aspect of it, um, but I can't say I've been active in that. Like I, 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 I try to reply to all the messages I get and all of that stuff, but I simply cannot in terms of energy, I cannot give back to the community as much as it gave me, I feel. Because if I do that, I'll go broke. <laughs> um, so in a sense, I'm, I'm one of the money-hungry people. I just um, i am poor enough to be able to claim that I, I have a pure heart. <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's, it's complicated. Like, people switch from, from, from being, yeah, I don't know. I, it is good and bad. It's probably one of the better industries to work in creatively, even if it's shit. <laughs> but I wouldn't agree what we what you said last, like that you don't give to the community. I mean, so something which is like super visible is that you always share and spread your knowledge, and this is something which is, I don't know, like the best way how 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 to um, give back, like through your through your blogs, through your videos, through your talks through um, workshops and so on so um i wouldn't i wouldn't not, agree on to that Vito. <laughs> there's, there's maybe a desire to uh, 
do more and then the inability to fulfill those desires. Um, it's like, yeah. I don't know. It feels like I, I, I feel very much like I'm just working a job these days. Like I'm just, okay, I have to make the next game and that's it. And like all of that starry eyed, like we're one big family stuff for me has kind of moved in the background, um, just in my day to day activities. And I've kind of, you know, like I have a, a bubble of developer friends and we share information non-publicly about opportunities and stuff and I don't go out and I like um, make all opportunities I find public or something like that, you know. But yeah, maybe I have too high expectations of myself, whatever. It's, it's yeah. That's, that's, how I, that's, how, that's how I feel. <laughs> But, but I have a, a follow up question here. Um, yeah. What are typical bad recommendations people tend to give or tend to get in the games industry? Because I already loved what you mentioned beforehand. And, and there, I, there are so many interesting recommendations, which I, uh, I think people might not agree with or not everyone. The, the, there's a very blanket statement uh, or a blanket piece of advice that is kind of ignorable in the long run, which is like, oh, to be successful, do this. And this can be any fucking thing. To be successful, release in January. To be successful, wear a funny suit to every convention. To be successful, I don't know, find out where the editor of IGN lives and send him a lot of chocolate, whatever the fuck. This very specific advice might work for like a year, but by the time it becomes public knowledge, it's already too old. And it's already useless because by the time it's public knowledge, everyone is doing it. So like, even if this advice works by like advice that really works, like to get, um, to sell units, to be able to survive, to, um, get exposure to like anything that's connected with any like material gain, um, any advice that is, yeah, any advice that is like about making money, which is not, I have come to realize an inherently bad thing <laughs> but any advice that is, that is concerned mainly with with selling your game with making money with getting exposure makes itself useless if it is good advice like if if if, if i have a piece of advice that really works like releasing in january i think two or three years ago that was the big thing you have to release in january right now january is full of uh indie games nobody can 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 play them all so the advice makes itself useless over time and because it's it's like too specific it's too actionable right that's a horrible thing Adv advice that you can actually act on will make itself useless over time um it's it's hard because when you get bad advice it can still be useful for you like you can follow it and realize okay that was shitty advice <laughs> which is much more like a, a much better learning experience than listening to someone tell you the smartest thing in the world and being unable to understand it. That has happened to me, I think, where I've had like conversations with people and three years later, I'm like, wow, now I have the experience to actually understand what they were saying. And they were saying really smart stuff. And they were saying it in ways that I could have understood if I had the experience already, but I just didn't have the experience. So I couldn't connect to it. So I couldn't really understand it um so it's it's fuck but yeah like if if someone tells you that you have to do x to sell x units uh, that's probably not true anymore mm. it's not even malicious it's just like outdated by the time it gets around mm. yeah. absolutely absolutely what um decisions have changed your life to a positive or maybe, I don't know, decisions or habits or changes. Um, smoking 20 cigarettes per day has been one of the best decisions of my life. No, that's not true. Uh, smoking cigarettes is bad and will kill you. Um, the, 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 there's a couple of decisions. Um, there's many decisions that changed my life for the worse. Um, the positive ones that are connected to game development are... Um, Moving to Sweden, um, I did that I think two years ago, 
And I, there's some folks music in the background now. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, but I moved to, to Sweden two years ago or something like that to just get away from everything because I needed a break. And I learned a lot in a completely new environment that was full of developers. And I just, just, just like, yeah, that was a good experience because I needed more like constant contact with other human beings at that time. And Sweden, like moving there gave me that. So that was good. Like when I'm unhappy somewhere, just actually do something about it. Um, the other good thing was to stop making games uh, pretty much two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. Yeah. I had like a huge nervous breakdown uh, uh, because I wasn't making any money and I was just uh, floundering and I felt like I was wasting uh, my time and my resources and I was very unhappy and I just said, okay, fuck it. I'm going to do a minimum, minimum wage job and try to get funding for a game. And I went to like therapy and I went on medication, which removed a lot of the hardcore anxieties that have had that had been with me for a long time, which is like a big, like going to like stopping going to therapy and actually like taking my mental problems seriously is probably the reason that I'm now more confident and relaxed and can take those low motivation periods in more grace. Um, just generally, it has made my life a lot better. And then the last good decision was quitting the same minimum wage job one year ago <laughs> to go uh, become self-employed again because that job was garbage. It was good for when I needed it, when I needed a break, when I needed to just do something and like earn a living and like not be broke. Um, but it was a horrible thing to do for the rest of my life. And it was very scary to quit that job, especially during a pandemic when like, I have no formal education. Like I will only get minimum wage jobs basically outside of the gaming. And like if I, if I stop to make games, there's not a lot of employment opportunities I have. Um, so quitting that job, it was kind of secure because of the quits of it. Like I could have just gotten money for a long time um, for being on call for the shitty hostel. Um, but quitting that job and taking that risk was a really good decision. So the good decisions were like going away and like changing something fundamental about my life when I was very unhappy. And then when that didn't work in the long term, changing even more fundamental stuff <laughs> about my life. And then after I had changed all that stuff about my life, actually going back to do what I wanted to do or what I wanted to do. <laughs> I guess that's it. It's like no, uh, it's, uh... I, I'm, I'm 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 reading Timothy Leary right now, or like listening to interviews. It's like tune in, buy in, tune in, drop out, or something. It's like this three-step program to becoming an LSD junkie. There's some similarities there, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but thanks for being so honest with us. I mean, topics like, like mental health and anxiety issues, this is something which our society often just ignores. And I mean, this is something which is which is huge and which is like so, I don't know, affecting so many of us. And um, I, I can't understand why people are still like, I don't know, trying to, to be silent or, around that because especially, especially since the pandemic, I, I think... Shame. There's so much shame in that. I just decided to not give a shit anymore at some point. Um, there's so much shame in like saying I am really sad and that doesn't stop. Because the first time you say it, you get sympathy. And after three years, it's like you yourself know that you don't get any better. And like you just want to forget about it. And yeah, I can, like I did that for a long time where I didn't talk about it. Um, I don't know. It's like at some point in the last two years, I just kind of something, something inside of me, like kind of like went open and I was like, okay, it doesn't fucking matter. Like I can just say the most insane stuff. And if it's really stupid and harmful, people will tell me to shut up and I will like rethink what I'm doing, but there's no, there's no real punishment for being open about this no. except like from myself. And if I don't punish myself, well, please. <laughs> I, I, 
I mean, I, I think it's even helping a lot um, with other people. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are many people also looking up to you and then like being honest about those topics really opens up this discussion and to see that, I don't know. Yeah, everyone um, is, is, is I, don't, I don't know, in, in, it's a, such a weird time, especially now. And every one of us has different struggles. And I, I think there shouldn't be any shame about talking to that. And I don't know. So thanks for opening that up. It's fine. It, yeah. It's, I don't know. It's risky in a way to, to keep bringing it up. Like, a, to, to, I don't know. Like, like even if I'm, I'm, I'm now relatively comfortable with like discussing uh, my, my issues or like mental health problems or whatever, I wouldn't want to initiate that discussion maybe mm. no like I, I i i just decided if someone asks me a question i'm just going to try to answer as truthfully as possible that doesn't mean that like i don't know i don't know i'm 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 i mean thinking i'm not being able to speak <laughs> i mean i mean all i'm saying it's um there's a difference whether um or to open up the discussion because um, you feel you don't want to talk about it because of the sake of um, yourself, whereas being ashamed of, um, of it um, because of of society's um, expectations. Mm. And I think like going to therapy, um, the, the, those are things which should be just so much more normal and nobody should mm. feel ashamed about those things. It's just um, and absolutely fine mm. if they're people don't want to discuss it because of of their own motivations but not because society thinks this is a shameful thing so that's that's all yeah. I'm, I'm saying yeah I mean, this is like even going to therapy is so expensive like I, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for like emotional and financial support of my parents so it's 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 uh, uh, when I don't want to say it's like the only solution. I don't want to present it like that or like that it's, it's like because it's not accessible to many people. It's very inaccessible, even to those who are like emotionally ready to admit that they need help. When you are like not able to afford that, what the fuck do you do that? I don't know. This is, this is like a topic where I, I haven't like come to any internal conclusions. I'm just going to ramble forever if I'm not stopped. <laughs> Then, then uh, there was already something which would trigger my next question. I mean, we, we talked about the, the decisions which changed your life for good. And you already mentioned, I mean, there was a lot of decisions, habits, I don't know, things which um, were not so good. Mm. But what would be so, super interesting as well, um, like also were there also any failures which actually then turned out to be a, um, leading to a success or to something... I don't know, more interesting? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, most failures in that period were probably just failures. Like, I mean, I can reverse engineer some failures into successes. Like, oh, because I didn't get um, like the uh, six times the funding I originally sought for because I, like, because I messed up that email thing I talked about earlier. Because I didn't get all of that money, I then was able to get the uh, funding for Quomp from Mario Zechner, thank you by the way, um, on like much better conditions, which allowed me to have like complete creative freedom and no oversight and like allowed me to work the way I, I work best. So like, of course, that is kind of a positive, but it also doesn't mean that I'm happy that I lost all that money. <laughs> it's like, this is okay, but yeah, I, I, I understand what you're trying to, to, to get it. I have to think, is there any concrete failure that led to success? Yeah, okay. In 2017, I think, I'm not good with year numbers, I had finished Quomp, which I just released in February, which was then called Pong, and I failed to submit the gold build of that game uh in the correct time i was two weeks too late which moved the whole release schedule back three months 
during those three months, the publisher I was with uh, split up and fled Europe and like stopped existing as a company and my game was not going to come out. That was a huge failure because of the two weeks delay. Uh, the, the two week delay turned into a three month delay, which turned into the essential cancellation of the game I'd worked on for two years. Um, why that failure is a success kind of is because I was not happy with that game, with what the game was at that time. So that failure like was really, really bad. Um, in the long run, I don't know if I'm happy that it happened, but it allowed me to make a better game out of that game, which now has released and is like out there as something that I can be proud of instead of something that I have to look back at with stomach aches. Uh, so always be two, lead, two, two, two weeks late for your deadlines. That's, the, <laughs> that's my advice for today. <laughs> okay. It will be good in the end. <laughs> I write it on my invisible note. <laughs> oh. No, good, good, good. Um, um, no, thank you so much. This, this is this is useful. Um, I mean, I I, I always try to see also good good stuff um, which might happen out of failures because I I don't know like just adding everything on this negative list and failure list. I I don't know. This doesn't get you any anywhere. Um, I mean, every every failure that you survive becomes a kind of success in its own right. If you want to think about it in a positive term, like what doesn't kill you allows you to fail tomorrow or something yeah. like that. Yeah. What? Mm, I mean, always I'm always super fascinated about rituals and habits. Do you have anything like that? Do you have any specific? I mean, I already have. I I know the morning cigarette coffee ritual. I already heard that. No, also during development. It's, okay. It's, it's it's sadly really. I have the, I, I can kind of supplement it with just going outside, but as soon as I'm outside, I just want to smoke anyway. Um, it's a, it's a, I, I learned that during a learn. I got addicted to that during, um, doing a lot of one-hour game jams, where if I have a really tough problem, or something, I will just go away from my computer and stare at the sky and think about it really hard and then give myself like five minutes to come up with a solution. Um, and the solutions are most of the time really stupid, but sometimes they work. That's something I, that's like a ritualistic thing I do, like a pattern thing. I mean, I fully yeah. understand like, like listening at the background noises. Um, this is so lovely. I mean, not the airplanes and the folks music. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's cool it's cool <laughs> um yeah i mean like I, I did this everywhere i live like not just here where it's actually nice outside <laughs> um it's just stepping away from a problem and then coming back to it like in a physical sense kind of helps in, in the brain for me Sorry, but I didn't. I don't think I let you finish your question. <laughs> Actually, I interrupted you with my cigarette. <laughs> no, 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 no. But just like general, <laughs> just general ritual habits. Um, this is something which which I am so fascinated about, because I think sometimes those are the things which eventually tr already trigger. Oh, maybe you're like going outside and 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 having the cigarette might be. I don't know, like the inspiration trigger, like that you're already conditioned. Yeah towards that i don't know yeah it, it, it definitely is like that like uh, my brain like I've, I've been doing this for so long um even before i was smoking a lot just like going outside uh literally for five minutes and then stepping back in and just looking at the trees or something um it's kind of a little reset or something or i don't know like like i, like I said i did it for one hour game jam where i would give myself like five minutes like i would go outside and five minutes later i had to have come up with a game idea it had to be done because there was no time to second guess it later. And I did that for I don't know, half a year or something. And it's kind of stuck. It's like, okay, problem, shitty solution. And in between that, there's five minutes. <laughs> and I guess it's, it's kind of uh, stuck in that way. Other rituals, uh, habits, it's more of a habit, a chew on stuff which is probably also related to my nicotine addiction, but I always have a pen 
next to my computer that I just obliterate with my teeth over time. Yeah. I, yeah. I can relate to that. <laughs> Maybe it's a, an actual ritual or like habit that is beneficial and not related to substance abuse. Um, I try to always throw stuff in the air and catch it again. Like, uh, I, like I don't juggle. I used to juggle, but like when I'm cutting onions or something, I will like take the knife and then I will throw it and try to flip it and catch it again. Or like, it's kind of stupid, but it keeps me uh, thrilled to cut onions, or like uh, like uh, I, I, like trying to like flip objects in specific ways or something. Like when I'm walking through the kitchen or while I'm waiting for a coffee or something, I'm like kind of pseudo juggling with everyday objects to keep my spatial awareness sharp because I basically don't move otherwise. <laughs> so so I, I, I try to to like stay nimble in that regard. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, it sounds a little dangerous, but I think the, the life as a game developer is dangerous <laughs> these days. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I have to get, get my adrenaline from, from somewhere. <laughs> what, what was the best investment you've ever made? Um, could be, I don't know, could be money, but could be also either time, resources, energy. Probably the the month that we took to develop Ord, where I could have done like paid work. Um, I think I'm not actually sure of the timeline. I could have done anything during that time, but we chose to like dedicate a month to making Ord, um, which is the first commercial game we then released because that was also a commercial failure, just to get back to the previous point. It was a big commercial failure in the beginning, um, but it showed me how Steam works and how many people actually see games on Steam and how those sales activation reports work and what happens when you put a game at 20% discount, like suddenly you make money out of nothing. And I realized that if I could keep the overhead low and the development times quickly, I could probably make a living out of this, which is not really true because most of my money comes from consoles, but <laughs> it's it's like uh, the stepping stone to getting on a console is to release on Steam for me. So that month where we just sat down and like designed the game, but not only designed it, but also figured out all of the Steam business stuff together, that was a great investment. That was really good. What advice would you give a very like motivated um, student who wants to enter the real game development industry? And what advice would you give and what advice should they ignore? I don't know. I'm, I'm not a part of the real game industry, I would say. Um, I mean, I am definitely a game developer and like working inside of the game industry, but I'm I'm, 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 I'm working with like secondary tertiary companies to get my games on other consoles. And there's like a lot of weird different stuff that I should probably tie in into an actual company at some point, but I don't have the capacities for paperwork to do that right now. So I'm like somewhere between a freelancer and a indie game studio. And there's just a shit ton of stuff in between. That's very weird and changes all the time. And like, yeah. Uh, the, this is not how most game developers work uh, because it's not that profitable, <laughs> I guess. Um, like I've never worked for a long time in an actual studio with like, uh, what is it called? The agile game development practices where you have these standups every day. I don't know what it's called. The... Like, this, uh, like Scrum. Scrum. Yes, I've never worked uh, with Scrum, which is essential uh, or appears to be essential to every actual studio. Um, okay, well, basically the point is there's a lot of like processes and flows and like um, workflows that I have no fucking clue about. I cannot give any advice on because I don't know how they work. Um, 
or when I come in contact with them, I like recoil like they're burning hot or something. Um, advice is I, I, I would advise you to make a lot of games yourself um, if you have the time and the resources. If you don't have the time and resources, then look for smaller tools, like look into Bitsy or Twine, uh, like we said before. They are fast and they require very low time investment to get actual games. Um, because yeah, like I think what I've, what I've repeated a lot over this, this discussion is that the, the way I learn is by looking at the stuff I did previously. And to be able to do that, I needed to have made stuff previously. <laughs> so if, 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 if your brain works the same way as my brain, then you should make stuff now so that in two years you can benefit from it. Because it takes that long for that like knowledge or like not knowledge <laughs> for that uh, information or for that experience to seep through your brain, and then in two years' time you'll be like, oh, okay, that's you know like and you you can you can think about your old stuff on a much more sophisticated level, which will then show you how unsophisticated you were before, which will then make you realize that you're probably currently extremely unsophisticated, um, which is. Uh, a good way to keep trying new stuff, I guess, and like trying to improve yourself. That's how it works for me. I don't know. Um, if you want to, if, if 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 you look at me and you're like, oh wow, that seems like a nice life, um, I would recommend you to to before you embark um, on a journey of self-employment, to get really really good with handling money and with like budgeting money and shit, because uh, that's scary. <laughs> Um, and dangerous if you do it wrong. Um, so if you want to become like a self self employed independent developer, or like a freelancer or something like that, learn how money works and how taxes work and how all of that shit works before before you get really excited about making games. Because once you're excited about making games, those things are gonna seem incredibly boring and you're never gonna do them. And then you will go to jail for tax evasion. <laughs> I know. I know. Is was this a cat or was this a bird? Oh, uh, it's, I think it's a bird, but the cat is looking at the bird. Okay. But there's like a. Oh, hello. <laughs> but there's like a protective piece of plexiglass where the birds normally sit, so the cats can't eat the birds. Oh. Oh. No. Yeah, well, um, Josh, this this has been super inspiring. Oh, okay, I I'm lost now. <laughs> this this is no, yeah. Thank this you so me. much. This 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 oh, this, yeah. this was great. This was um, super super honest, super super useful. So much good stuff in there. Is there anything else which you would like to share from your side? I'm looking forward to coming to Graz again and to drink beer with all of the real people <laughs> that are there. <laughs> and like, I don't know. I hope you're doing well <laughs> out there in front of your computers. Yeah, we yeah. absolutely look forward to to having Graz soon as well. Hopefully, hopefully this summer the situation is better. But it's good that you to see that you seem to be coping well with this weird situation. I was, uh, when, when it started, I was like, I have trained for this my whole life. And then the roof fell on my head a lot harder, a lot later than usual, I guess. Because it was super fine for like the first year, and then I just crashed hard. It was okay again. The weather is nice. That's good. <laughs> oh. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah. everyone, um, Josh will be also part of the Game Dev Days next week. So looking forward to that. So more. Next week? <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. No, this, this was fun. It's always good to talk to you. This is always like very yeah. inspirational. And it's so honest. It's, it's a really pleasure. Like talking to someone and, and hearing all those really, really honest sides of good sides and and things which are not ideal. Let's put it that way. Thanks. That's, 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 that's probably the, the 
first compliment I ever got was when a teacher said to me when I was like five years old, what I like about you is you're very honest. And I, I treasure that. And I tried to <laughs> live by that. And it didn't always work. I was very dishonest for a long period of time. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I need some water, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was two wonderful two hours. This escalated. Wow. wow. We just yeah. just for the chat, we wanted to start with 30 minutes. <laughs> Thanks. We can, we, can, we can keep it short next time and just sum everything up. So just just um, for the for the note in the chat, you just heard there will be a next time. So to be continued. Oh, no. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Would be fun. Also, if, if, if you've been writing stuff in the chat, I have not opened the switch because that would probably kill my Wi-Fi. So I'm sorry. I've not been ignoring you. I just I, and was, it was a summary of we love the gifts um, because this is a good community contribu contribution. This is also something which is really lovely. I mean, don't say that you don't contribute to the community. I mean, you're doing so many different things. And I mean, just by making cool games, I, I, I really enjoyed playing Quam, for instance. And this is you're bringing joy. And we have so you much have more. Like hours in that game, I've saw, I've seen it on your Steam review. You played it for a. <laughs> did you fall asleep or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I took it very seriously. <laughs> okay, maybe I fell asleep, but no, no. <laughs> okay, but sometimes I'll just return. But I, I think I played it at least um, uh, more than once. So it's, it's really. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. I know I'm, people I'm, are I'm looking like, at my was, Steam I profile. Just, I, was just wondering, I was looking at no, I was not. I was looking at the Steam reviews, and it always says the time next to me. I was like, "Wow, that's really long." <laughs> but yeah, you you did the A sprite thing, I guess, with like constantly typing out. Doesn't matter. Sorry, uh, keep interrupting the the ending. Slides. No, thank you so much, and um, yeah, everyone also in the chat, thank you so much for joining. Um, again, yeah. more Tosh next week. <laughs> and Friday, Josh? <laughs> Friday, Josh. Yeah, as a completely different person. Um, unhinged. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks Thanks so much for having me. Um, we'll, we'll talk really soon, I guess. Perfect. Bye, everyone. Good night. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. For stopping by.